we began school, we sometimes start in kindergarten or first grade, it's incumbent that we learn patterns. And we can start at a very minor level and not just, well, just look at blue, green, blue, green. I don't see a pattern. Well, you can graduate from kindergarten, Mr. Fyatt. That's good. And then we go to first grade. We may be more detailed type of patterns, but we're to see those patterns. And we see the importance of people as they develop mentally and learn more in school that understand patterns. And we see it's very important when we fly in an airplane that they better hold to the pattern that's set before them or we may have a, a catastrophe on our hands. So we realize, I hope those guys in the tower give them the right pattern, hope the people are flying that plane will be holding to that pattern. But we're not talking about school, we're not talking about your air travel, but pattern is important with God. 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul tells Timothy to hold not to the word of God. He didn't just say that. He didn't say, I want you to hold uh, healthy words. He didn't just say that. He did. But he says, hold to the pattern of sound words. Hold that pattern. That healthy teaching from God's word says set forth in a very important pattern. Now, we go to God's word and we live in a time where we're not holding the book. A lot of you are not just holding the book like I am. You got other things like smartphones and iPads and what have you. And you may be texting to someone. I don't know. <laughs> the moment I catch you, you'll say, I got 2 Timothy 1.13 up here. What are you talking about? And some of you are so quick, I probably couldn't catch you. But whatever means you have, it's the word. It's the word of God that we need to be having in our mind. And there is indeed a pattern that is set forth in God's word. I want to emphasize that this morning about the pattern and how that is essential. You see it in this passage. But also how it is involved in and being very important that we follow the pattern. And please note this passage, we can do so with faith and love. Sometimes patternism, it just takes away my love for God. No, it doesn't. Patternism just takes away uh, uh, serving God by faith. No, it doesn't. You hold the pattern of sound words, faith and love. And that's exactly the way that we should be looking at God's word. Let's begin by the first point, understanding that when God has set forth a pattern, he has a purpose that will be communicated and is involved by holding to the pattern. We will be latching hold of something that God wants us to have to set forth purpose. I think we see this in Exodus 25th chapter. When, as we've been studying on uh, our Wednesday evening classes about Exodus and the people in the the wilderness. And as God gave Moses instruction about how to build the tabernacle, we find in Exodus 25 40, it says, See that thou make them after their pattern, which I have showed thee in the mount. It wasn't say, Now hold to a pattern and you figure out what it is. I showed you the pattern. I want you to make things according to the pattern. Well, I know from verse 14 that one of those things was the Ark of the Covenant. And he was to make it, in verse 14, Thou shalt put the staves into the rings on the sides of the Ark, wherewith to bear the Ark. Now that is a profound statement. Not when we're reading it in this text. It just, I'm going to do the pattern. We'll put rings in that Ark of the Covenant. We'll put staves in that. And I know the purpose is that it is to be carried. What makes it profound is that when people did not follow the pattern, God's people suffered for it. He said, here's the purpose that he set forth that is to carry that. 
We come to 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter. We're in the days of King David, a man after God's own heart. But he's one that he wants to construct the tabernacle, the temple of God. He's not going to be able to do that. His son Solomon will. But he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant and to Jerusalem and so forth. And we'll find that in verse 7, it says, And they carried the Ark of God upon a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahau drove the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, even with songs and with harps and psalteries and timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. It is an exciting, joyous occasion. Here's the ark of, the, of, of God. And here is his presence and his authoritative presence because his word is there. All of those things. And we're so joyous. By the way, as uh, you're driving the cart that has the Ark of the Covenant on it, no big deal. It got carried, didn't it? It's not an old dilapidated cart, is it? It's new. We got confident drivers if that'd be okay. Don't have to follow that pattern. We know what happened to us, though, because things happen. And verse 9, they came into the threshing floor of Kadah, and Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the cart for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put forth his hand to the ark and there died before God. It was to be carried and only by the Levites. And David gets this. In 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles 15, we'll find that, well, in verse, verse 2, David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. He should have known that. That's exactly the way God had designed it. And it was to be carried by them and then we look at verse 13. For because you bore it not at the first, Jehovah our God made a breach upon us, came down and struck us a dead, for that we sought him not according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of Jehovah, the God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon. And Moses, as Moses commanded according to the word of Jehovah. Now, do you know why it's important to follow the pattern? Us is not here to talk to him about it. David understood. Let's get back to following God according to his ordinances. And may I say, according to his pattern. Is it too difficult to build rings and put staves and that's to carry it by the Levites? Is that too much of a pattern for you? Because it was neglected, we find that calamity happened to them. Death occurred. God breached upon them with death. And if they'd have followed the pattern, would these things have happened? But God has purpose in his pattern. Now, let's see that with our worship. Coming together to worship. Here are passages that I know you understand and know, but the part of, part of assembling is not so we can feel good about coming on a cold, rainy morning and just say, wow, we must be godly because we got out of bed and came. I'm glad you came. I'm glad we're here. What's the purpose of coming? Not to gloat. It's to encourage one another, provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the custom of some is. That's sound teaching. Assembling is not just for my benefit. I'm coming because I want to encourage other brethren. Sometimes we think of it in terms of selfishness. Oh, I'm thinking about others. What are we doing? Singing. The word of Christ, or the word of God is dwelling in us richly. And we're taking the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're singing and making melody in our heart unto God. We're praising him, adoring him in song. 
instructing others as we assemble together. There's the part of preaching, that we're to preach the word with all long suffering and teaching. We're to be exhorting, here's the way you ought to go, rebuking, this is what you ought not to do, and we find the authority of God's word behind it. He's behind preaching and our singing and, and we're praying. Acts 2.42, they were steadfast in prayer. We'll find the church is gathered together in Acts 12 and verse 12. And they're praying for Peter that we see took place in verse 5. He said, well, well they just prayed. Everybody in their own little closet. And they're, they're praying. No, the church was praying together, verse 12. Public prayer. And why is prayer so important? We don't have time to go into... All of Luke 18, 1, but I want you to put two things together. I want you to turn over there with me. And Luke 18 is encouraging us to pray and that we should never give up. And he gives the example of the unrighteous judge and so forth. And he says in verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Prayer is connected with faith. Why? Because it is expressing my trust to you, O God, Give us this day our daily bread. I'm trusting you to make, have, have those provisions. I need to work. I need to do all those things. But that's very, very important. Because I'm depending upon you. God knows we have need of those things before we ask. Why ask? It's about my faith and my trust in him. That's why we pray. Did you notice that right after this, he speaks about prayer? He's speaking about prayer of two men, one is a Pharisee set apart. He's pure. He's connected with God's word. He's in familiar surroundings, goes right into the temple, and he approaches God. He's going to pray. There's another one kind of on the outskirts. He's a tax collector. Those are the interesting two things that Jesus presents. Tells of what they do, who they, and what group they belong to. Nobody liked a tax collector. But that point about prayer, notice when he says in verse 9, unto certain who trusted in themselves. Faith and prayer is connected. Why did he pray the way he did? Did he pray and he didn't have thanksgiving to God? No, he's full of thanksgiving. I'm not like that guy. Here's what I do. But he was trusting in himself. And all the tax collector could do, he couldn't even look up. Because the posture of prayer, those days, hands were unfolded and they looked straight into heaven. He had to look down. Be merciful to me, a sinner. She said, that man went to his house that day justified. Two things about prayer. Don't ever give up. Keep on praying. God will answer that prayer. Why? Because you show your trust in him. And trust is a big problem in the next phase, facet because they trust it in themselves. And we usually think, why do you not pray? I don't need to pray. i got it all taken care of by myself. got a good job good money, I got a good house, I got everything going my way, what do I need from God? So you probably won't be praying. God said, this is what I want my people to do. And on the first day of the week, I want them to take the Lord's Supper, not quarterly. See, we're coming together and we're there to take the Lord's Supper. What do we do? We, we, we are manifesting and expressing and declaring the death of Christ until he comes again. And we do that on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and 7, by an example. And then our giving was to take care of needs of the saints, but it has more meaning to that. You read that in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 13. It was showing, are we going to obey the gospel that says Jew and Gentile are one? Are you willing to give Jews to the, or Gentiles to the Jews? and helping them in their particular problem, all that's found there. Everything was filled with purpose. Wonder if we start changing the pattern of worship. Oh, I'm not speaking here. Let's add instrumental music to it. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> because, see, 
God specified singing. But I want to look at it from another angle. Let's just eliminate the preaching today. How would you like that? I'll be out of here maybe an hour before we usually are. Wow, that'd be good. I'm not going to preach an hour, I hope. But if it's the case, we'll limit it. And after all, don't you know, we've been teaching God's word and singing. Let's just have singing for our gospel meetings. We'll teach a lot of word of God in doing that. And let's, let's just eliminate the preaching. Now, you probably know which side I'm on. But yeah, can you have a point? <laughs> Every one of our songs, did you notice they had scripture in it? They had scripture in it. And we could just bring down the time frame of our worship service. They're a little too long anyway. And let's just get rid of the preaching. We will, we'll just do this pattern. Let's just sing. Take the Lord's Supper, say a little prayer, and, 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 and maybe two or three prayers and... and we're out of here. That's great. We took care of that. Do you think about this? Where did those songs come from? Why is the scripture there? The editors of those psalm books, they wanted that scripture because we're going to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We're to be involved in doing that. So we can be involved in knowing where these things come from. I need to know about no tears in heaven. I need to know, is it for me, dear Savior? I need to know those things that are expressing adoration from a standpoint of God has first revealed it, not Samuel Reed. I got it from God's Word. Not from Bob Arnold. Tears in heaven, in Gethsemane alone. I read that in God's word. I've heard it preached. I've heard it applied to my life. That's part of God's pattern. That we need to understand there are themes that we cover in preaching. Maybe you're not going to cover in singing. When elders sin, tell me what song I can sing that day. Got one? Because I've got to rebuke them publicly. Where did you find that? I didn't find it in your hymnal. I find it in our word of God. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, let the elders rule, the rule well be kind of worthy of double honor. It says, verse 19, against an elder receive not an accusation except by the mouth of two or three witnesses. And them that sin, he writes to Timothy and evangelist, them that sin reprove in the sight of all that the rest also may be in fear. All of a sudden we've got evangelists standing up over the elders. Got a little problem there. No, evangelists are taking the word of God and what's been confirmed by witnesses. Brethren need to understand, here is a man in leadership and he sinned. We're going to follow the pattern. Tell me what song we can sing to teach that. We're going back to God's Word. And there's so many things of God's Word. And what helps, see, put them together. What helps is that Word of God is in our hearts. And when I sing those songs, I've been over it and over it and over it. And I'm filled with thanksgiving and adoration for God. Because you're putting it all together. And I've been here in the assembly because I've assembled to make it possible. And I'm here to encourage, want to hear God's word. I'm here to take the Lord's Supper to proclaim his death till he comes. All of it goes together. And if we start changing the pattern, we're going to probably eliminate the purpose that God had expressed it to be done in the first place. That's what we're going to probably have a problem doing. I don't want to do that. When you hold to that pattern, begin to realize all these things work together so beautifully. Just like staves in the rings of an ark carried by 
sanctified man in the Old Testament. Secondly, God's pattern possesses his authority, and we need to hold to it because it's expressing that authority. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10 and 11, we see an incident in the lives of the Old Testament people that God says, I want you New Testament Christians to get a hold of. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and perished by the destroyer. Why is it important that these things have happened unto them by way of example? They were written for admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. This idea of example is the idea that here's this pattern. Here's what they did. They murmured. And I think we need to set the stage for that murmuring. And very quickly in Numbers the 16th chapter, there were people murmuring because of the authority that Moses and Aaron seemed to have and that the rest of them were deprived of. They murmured about that. Korah and his associates. And he says to them in verse 3, you take too much upon seeing all the congregations are holy. They're all holy. Every one of them and Jehovah's among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the assembly of Jehovah. We go in there, he, they think Paul, uh, Moses is trying to be a prince. And he hadn't gotten us to the promised land yet. And they're just griping and complaining. And after all, we're Levites, and here you, but you're the high priest. And there's a family of the priest. You take too much upon you. We're all this way. We could all have equal authority, could we not? We drop down to verses 28 and 30. We'll find Moses hereby. You shall know that Jehovah has sent me to do all these works, for I've not done them of my own mind. There's the authority of God behind it. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitations of all men, that Jehovah hath not sent me. It was time to take their censures. It was time to find out whose side God is on. In verses 31, it came to pass as he made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them. He said, that's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, I'm not of God. It did. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and the households and all the men that appertain unto Korah and all their goods. So they all with appertain to them went down alive unto Sheol. And the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the assembly. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them and they said, lest the earth swallow us up. No, I'm going to let fire take care of you. And fire came forth from Jehovah and devoured the 250 men that offered the incense. What a sign of God's authority and his wrath. God says, Moses, Aaron, high priest. We don't like that pattern. After all, we're all equal as far as holiness is concerned. They wanted to change it. And it was all about God's authority. But yet, we haven't come to 1 Corinthians 10, 10, 11 yet. That's just the foundation. We come to it when we read about what happened to them. On the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you've killed the people, Jehovah. God's authority is going to be set forth because we find that before the plague was stayed, Verse 49, now they that died by the plague were 14,700. Whoa, quite a bit more than 250 that went down by fire and countless others that went down and, 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 and live into Sheol. The ground covered them up. Silence. 14,700 besides them that died about the matter of Korah. You complain about my authority? Here's what I think about it. That's instructive. Give me a song that sings that one. Preaching establishes this in our minds. Here's God's pattern. This is his example. I don't want to murmur against God's authority. 
Do your hospitality, 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11. Do your hospitality without murmuring. If you note the context there, all the energy that I have, I take the oracles of God, is that God will be glorified in Jesus Christ. That's why I do hospitality. It's not about me. It's not about me looking good. It's about me glorifying God. And when I do hospitality, and I love without hypocrisy, and I love from a pure heart, it's all about doing you good, but to God's glory. I will not mess that up by complaining about it, or murmuring about it, or griping about it. I do it because I want Jesus to be glorified. And I know that when I violate that pattern and I start murmuring that that's not pleasing to God. And just these little things, they have a great power in our influence in the world for Christ. In Philippians 2, 2nd chapter, verses 14 and 15, we read that we're to do all things without murmurings and questionings. That's not, we're not critical of one another and, and here recognize shortcomings, let's go, we can do better. It's not saying, well, just not ignore that and not, not be upset about it. No, complaining is that here's what we have to do and, and we don't like that. He said, I want you to do without murmurings that you become blameless and harmless children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom your sin is lights in the world. Why? The elders say, I've got to be here every service. I don't like that. I, didn't say, I want to complain about that. I can come here once in a while. Get off my case. No, you need to be here to please God. Because Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says you have a responsibility as a child of God and serving God. You need to be here. You need to be here and participate in all the facets of worship. And the moment you say, I don't have to go, how's the fellow working with you or the lady working with you? What are you going to think about your life as a Christian? Probably not even think you are one. But especially if you complain about it. We will be harmful. And it's all about God's authority and his glory anyway. One pattern. God says, I don't murmur. Because what it does, and I'll go against that pattern. Here's the way God said, do it. And here's, he's given us some information why we should do it, like our worship. I am murmuring against God's authority. Holding to that pattern, which involves, I will not murmur, is respecting his authority. Not doing, well, I think we can do church differently now. We hold to it. It's full of purpose, and it possesses authority. And these little things become very important because I want to look at a little thing that makes leadership effective. And that is lead by example. Peter is a fellow elder. Bible never says he's the Pope. There again is another lesson on pattern. God put elders, plurality in every church. Didn't put one man over all the church. Follow his pattern. I respect his authority. And there is purpose there. That we won't have a pope. We won't have a single person directing the affairs of God. We'll be connected with Jesus. But Peter, as he addresses fellow elders, says in verse 2 and 3 about tending the flock. And he says, neither, verse 3, as lording it over the charge allotted to you but making yourselves an example to the flock. Some look at the passage and say, well, there's the authority of the elders. They just have the authority as they by, lead by example. They really have no authority of laying down a law of how we should do things. But they just lead by example. But you look at Hebrews 13, 17, they rule... They are watchful over our souls. And the Hebrew writer says that we are to submit to them. Now that's more than just 
I like, hey, that's a good example. Let's move on. What I want to do. No, they're directing us. What are they doing? I tell you, leadership says, here's our goal. And all the elders should have the goal of every child of God going to heaven that they watch over. How am I going to go from here to there? It will be a joyous occasion for me. I'm one of the elders. And the elders look at that. But it won't be if you're not going to submit to them because they are watching for your souls and because their work was never profitable to you. That's more than just leading by example. But what it does, it says, here's what makes your watchfulness and rule and in accomplishment effective. You lead by example. That's effective leadership. Where do men who serve the Lord's church as elders, where do they start developing that? 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, they do it in the home. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, that's a qualification that every man that becomes an overseer in the church of God, in the local church, he manifests that. If a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? What's happening? Here's a family. All the children. Notice, they just act so perfectly. They're never out of line. They're good little kids. Good teenagers. That's great. But the rule here, there was subjection with all gravity. That subjection is full of dignity. It's serious, but the dignity is there. That the children are not submitting because if I don't, they're going to beat me half to death. I dare not say a word because dad's going to beat me. Oh, he's got him under his thumb all right. But not with the dignity and the seriousness of children submitting out of respect and love for their father. That's the type of leadership that must be in the home. And people see that in the congregation and they put them said. So these will be elders. How do you gain that in your home, fathers? By laying down the law or showing them how it's to be done? Example. That's how you lead. It's not just elders, preachers. Titus is an evangelist. He says, in all things showing thyself, Titus 2, 7, an example of good works, not good theory. I got, I got these ideas and, and I will talk about them. No, it's an example of good works. They're putting into action and you are being seen doing those things. And by the way, in thy doctrine showing uncorruptness and gravity, there's our dignity expressing the dignity we have that here's God's law, here's his authority, and I will not pervert it. I will just tell this is what God says. I'm doing so with dignity. Well, I'll preach it. But I'll stay in my office and I'll be not involved with the people. You'll never see them be out there. I'm, I'm studying. I'm going to make sure I cut it straight. He said, I want you to be an example of good works and uh, teaching sound. Because that helps the word come alive. 2 Thessalonians, Philippians 3.17, it's effective for the apostles. 
Imitate me, he says. Think about that. Person, uh, imitate me. We know in 1 Corinthians 11 of 1, as he imitates Christ, we understand that's behind Paul. But mark them that so walk, even as you have us as an example. As he's following Christ, the apostles, authority of the apostles, all their teaching, got to follow the apostles. But they were also being an example. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 9, when a church in Thessalonica needed to understand that they needed to work, that was connected with their eating of their bread, they weren't working. What did Paul do? He laid down the law. He laid down, here's the tradition that comes from God. Man will not work, neither let him eat. He taught the truth, but he lived it. He said, I have, I have the freedom, I have the right for you to be paying me for my bread. But I forgo that because I'm going to be an example to you. Paul's working. He's longing for the second coming. He's working. He's the man that we do it. What happens? Effective leadership has worked out what is the purpose. What's the purpose of all the things that we're doing? And they're leading by example. They're doing those things as they lead the flock along. And ladies and gentlemen, the flock, they're not dumb sheep just being told what to do. Sheep will follow when they realize here's the route that we need to go and our elders are leading. The preacher is leading and young people, you're leading. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, Paul's comparatively a young man. And he said, let no man despise thy youth. How do I keep from the despising that I'm young? I don't have any experience. Preacher been preaching the last four weeks on people being simple. He's talking about me. You know I wasn't talking about your intelligence. I'm talking about your experience in life. But what can you do about it now? You're 12 or 13, all of a sudden you say, I'm 40. No. Be down in sample, verse 12. To them that believe, it's your fellow brethren, regardless of their age, in word, in manner of life, in love, in faith, in purity. I'll take care of the despising part. And young people, you may not realize this, I don't care what your age is, there's something a little bit younger looking up to you. And they're looking at your example. And if we hold to this teaching, and I don't know a song that puts all this together. I don't think somebody composed that one. Preaching gets it done. Elders, and preachers, People following that example, younger men are be developing themselves in their own home. They have examples to follow. Young people, we got a congregation full of people. And all we're doing is holding to the pattern of sound words. And what's happening, we've unlocked something that people say, I just wonder why leadership suffers. It's because we've Forsaken the pattern. People lead from behind instead of leading forth from in front. And when that type, when that pattern of God, we see in all these passages, are set forth, we will be having elders with effective leadership, young people that have examples to follow and they're following in their life. They're being examples to others. A preacher is not just preaching He's living it. And we're not complaining about God. We love Him. And everything we do is for Him to get glory. When that's in our mind, then we'll be the type of people we want to be. And you know where that comes back to? Holding to His pattern. It's full of purpose. It's full of His authority. Unlock some great mysteries. Today, unlocks the one about leadership. I hope we'll take it to heart. This morning, those of you who are outside of Jesus Christ, 
Jesus gave himself up for thee, what are you going to give him? And Jesus demands our all, our heart, our heart, soul, body, mind, strength. Everything we've got, we give it to him. And we realize, why is that? Because he gave it all to us. He died for us so that we could be justified from our sins and to live a godly life and with the confidence that one day we'll be in heaven, even though we're not sinless. If you've fallen away from the Lord, get back to the pattern. Confess your sins, repent, pray. God will forgive you. You're among a people that are ready to forgive and ready to receive you back to the Lord and encourage you again to be the type of people you ought to be. If you're not a child of God, never obey the gospel. What's the pattern? People heard the word so they could believe it. Romans 10, 17. They repent of their sins. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Everybody everywhere is to repent of their sins. They were baptized for the mission of their sins. Acts 2, 38. And on the, their confession of faith when they were baptized, they expressed with their mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. We go back to God's word. Not some Church of Christ five-digit doctrine. It's what God says. And we say, I just put my trust in him, and it's where I will do that. You follow that pattern. You'll be reminded the day you were baptized. Didn't you die to sin? If you start living a life that's not sinless and not right with God. It has purpose. Follow his pattern. Only your soul will be saved. But you will be respecting his authority, accomplishing his purpose. And along the way, you'll unlock a lot of mysteries. That helps us to be a faithful church. Trust that you'll start that now as we stand and as we sing.